This is ODAT Chat, your instant connection to recovery and community, one day at a time. This podcast may contain strong language, sexual content, and spiritual truth. Listener discretion is advised. friend, welcome to another episode of the Oda Chad podcast. In case you're new here, my name is Arlena and I'll be your host. Today, I'm honored to share an episode with the host of the very popular podcast, The One You Feed with Eric Zimmer. At the time of this recording, it had over 15 million downloads. His guest list reads like the who's who of teachers and healers. This list includes guests like Byron Katie, Dan Millman, Russell Simmons, and Simon Sinek, just to name a few. But before we jump in, I'm really excited to share a resource to solve a problem that so many of us in recovery have, which is weight gain and emotional eating. We're hosting a free webinar, The Secrets to Quickly Lose Stubborn Body Fat for Busy Professionals Over 40, and this is without starving or exercising even if you've never been able to lose weight before. It's a health coaching program based on a meal plan generated from a blood test, which identifies the right foods for your specific body's needs. I did over a year ago and lost 16 pounds in less than 12 weeks. My husband lost over 50 pounds um, and he did it about two years ago. It was such a life-changing experience that we developed the metabolic food system to include everything you need to restore your metabolism so that you can achieve your ideal body weight and a class called How to Stop Emotional Eating. So it's all wrapped into one. It's a highly personalized program, so we can only take 10 clients at a time. Once those spots are filled, we won't open up the program again for another three months. If you're ready to lose weight, and want to learn more, visit metabolicfoodsystem.com. So today's guest, Eric Zimmer, is an author. He's a TEDx speaker and a behavior coach. Eric shares about how he grew up, his family, and how he descended into drug addiction. Although he eventually achieved long-term sobriety, he also shares what happened when he relapsed and the challenges of trying to get sober again. Listen, I'm not going to give everything away. So with that, please enjoy this wide ranging episode with Eric. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chad podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I am so excited. I know I say that all the time, but um, it feels authentic every time. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's a a mark of a good podcaster. They're excited. Oh, really? Yes. Thank you. Oh. Means, that means a lot to me coming from you. You're hosting, uh, you're co-hosting The One You Feed, which is an amazing podcast. I was so excited when I got the email. It's like, hey, you want to view, interview Eric? I was like, oh, I dare not hope. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are. Here I am. Here you are. So um, I just have to start and ask you, what is it like? To have 10 million, oh, I'm sorry, 15 million (laughs) downloads of your podcast. Um, You know, I, first it's wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful that the show has been able to touch as many people as it has, um, that it's been able to help as many people. Um, You know, I'm fortunate now where the show's grown to the point where that and my coaching work is what I do for a living. I feel very extraordinarily fortunate in that. That took me about four, four and a half years to get there. Um, But so I feel very fortunate uh, in that way. And then at the same time, having 15 million downloads is like most things in life, right? We get used to our current reality right? And if we're not careful, we take it for granted. And so that's the, that's the challenge, right? Is to, is to wherever we are with whatever we have is how do we, how do we not take it for granted and how do we be grateful for it? Right, right. Because there's a lot of people who are thinking of starting a podcast who look at you and go, what must it be like to host, you know, <laughs> the ODAT podcast? Seriously, there are, you know, that, that are really looking at where you're at. And so I think it's, you know, like I said, it's, that's the, that's the wonderful and, and challenging thing about being a human is we grow adapted to almost anything. And that's really good news when what we're growing adapted to our painful situations, right? right. You know, we, 
we can we can get used to difficult circumstances. But the flip side is, of course, if we're not careful, we start taking the good things in our lives. We become completely habituated to them. And we're like, yeah, whatever, 15 million downloads. You know, like it's <laughs> we have to watch for that. I do. I do anyway, for sure. Yeah, no, that is such a good, that's a, such a good lesson in life. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Dan Millman. He wrote The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Yes. And he talked about um, the rules for being human. And one of them was there is no better than here, because once you get there, you just find a new there yeah. and and strive towards that. But it's it's so interesting because I've been kind of obsessed lately with this idea of, all the different ways we use to disassociate from the present moment, from yeah. who who we think we are, because I think, uh, and and this is why I love the premise of your podcast, the one you feed, and I, you know, it's I live by this idea that what you think about, you bring about, right? right. Like, what are we focusing our attention on, and what do yes. we value, and and all that. So. Um, yeah, it's just amazing to me all the different ways we we distract from the present moment and we forget about all the good things that we really are. So yeah. I love that you focus on that. And do you want to do you want to just share with my audience about the one you feed, the the parable that you start each podcast with? Sure. And you know, people in recovery may be familiar with this because I heard it in in you know, in 12 step rooms is where I first heard it a me long too. time ago. Yeah. Um, but it's a parable that uh, goes like this. There's a grandfather who's talking with his grandson. He says, in life, there are two wolves inside of us that are always at battle. One is a good wolf, which represents things like kindness and bravery and love. And the other is a bad wolf, which represents things like greed and hatred and fear. The grandson stops and thinks about it for a second. And he looks up at his grandfather. He says, well, grandfather, which one wins? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. So that's the parable. And so we use that as a um, a jumping off point with each of our guests. So I start the show by reading that parable to each of our guests and say, hey, what does that mean to you in your life and in the work that you do? That's amazing. And and I was looking at your list of guests that you had, you've had on your podcast. And listen, it's like the who's who of the healers of the world. <laughs> Why don't we do Emmy? Like, why don't we have like an Academy Award for teachers, healers? Because if there were, you would have like, <laughs> you would have like all the Academy Award recipients. Um, you've had Don Miguel Ruiz, Simon Sinek, Tara Brock. Oh my gosh, I love her. Yeah. Um, yeah. Doc, uh, Father Richard Rohr, Gabor Mate. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his last name right, but he is amazing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we, we've been very fortunate to have uh, a lot of really wonderful guests. It's been, um, that's been a joy for sure. And, you know, you mentioned Dan Millman. Dan was one of our first guests. And I was blown away by the fact that he was willing to come on a show that didn't exist at that point. Like we were just starting. Wow. And I wrote him a really heartfelt email because that book for me was, was a huge, you know, the way of the peaceful warrior was like, boom, you know, it kind of was a really big thing to me. And so, yeah, when Dan agreed to come on very early on, I was just like, wow, you know, so generous. And, and, um, so yeah, we've been, we've been very blessed with the people that we've, we've been able to have on. That is amazing. I didn't realize, I didn't even see that he was one of your, we've done so many episodes now. How many episodes are you in? 280 some probably at this point. Yeah. I mean, even the, our, the podcast feed you get doesn't even go back to the beginning anymore because you can only put so many out there in a feed at a time. And so all of them are available on, on the website, but those early ones like Dan Millman aren't there. You, you know, you got to go wow. to the website. For them. I'm, so. I'm so glad. Uh, that's magical that that actually even came up. I didn't realize I'm going to have to go back and <laughs> dig yeah, your archives. Ordinary. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, I think I'm not sure. I think it was after I got sober that, that I read that book and it, it really, I, I had the same, it had the same effect on me where it just really changed the way I thought about my approach to life. And, and that's one of the things that I've loved about recovery is all the teachers that I've discovered since I started this journey. Um, do you want to just maybe highlight some of your most favorite teachers? Sure. I mean, I, that, that question is a little bit like being asked, who's your favorite child? <laughs> who's your favorite kid? 
<laughs> yeah, that's but true. Like, and that's not really fair, but no, but, but it's fair. I can, I can give some, I can give a few answers to that. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. so, you know, there were one very early episode was with a guy named Mike Scott, who's a, he's the, he's a, he's a, mu- he's a musician. He's the lead guy from a band called the water boys. And I had been a fan of the water boys since I was like 15, like super fan. Wow. So having him come on, and again, that was pretty early. It was probably in our first twenty episodes. Having him come on was just such a, just such a moment for me. Yeah, you know, to, to have somebody that you'd looked at that long. Um, so that was a that was a really big one for me. Um, trying to think of other ones, you know, the ones that I do in person tend to stand out to me. There's just something about being able to do it in person. And so, you know, a, a person we've interviewed more than anybody else is a spiritual teacher, Adi Ashanti. Yes. Um, and I've done those at his Open Gate Sangha in um, San Jose, California. And those have been really special for me uh-huh. um, just to sit down in person with him and do those. And there just seems to be a connection. He and I have a connection. Wow. You can just, I'm sure there's, you know, you have a connection with all guests, but some you just really resonate with. And, and so those have been really, really important ones to me also. I didn't realize he was in San Jose. I just moved from there. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I saw oh, in San Francisco, uh, your 49ers. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're doing this on video <laughs> too. Yeah. Yeah, 49ers, yay. Um, wow, that that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, it's so interesting when you've like I've had experiences where I have spent years studying somebody's teachings and following them and listening to all the content that they put out, and then you have a conversation with them and you're like, whoa, this is a real person. It's right. just <laughs> Yeah. It makes me I was I was having this conversation with someone the other day about spiritual teachers, and he was saying, you know, he was was saying something about, I mean, we see a lot come up with spiritual teachers, right? You just see li- lots of bad behavior come out of spiritual teachers, just like you do out of everybody, right? Sure. I mean, bad behavior is everywhere. But to, to, to reference Adi Ashanti again, he sometimes says, if you want a perfect spiritual teacher, find a dead one. <laughs> find a dead one. <laughs> right? Because, oh, my you know, God. You, you can project whatever you want onto the dead, you know? Living people will, they'll do what, they'll do things that living people do. Yeah. Yeah, just make and 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 be fallible and and it is interesting because I think we have a tendency. One thing that interviewing two hundred and eighty people, a lot of whom, like you said, might be considered on the who's who's list of, you know, healers out there, is you realize that the, they are just ordinary people, and despite mm-hmm. all their wisdom, they suffer like we suffer. Yeah. You know, like that we're not we don't get to be exempt right. from life. And I think that's what so much of us, so many of us want out of a spiritual teacher or out of spiritual lessons is we want just to be, we want the, we want to be exempt from life being hard, life being painful. And none of us get that. Right. There is sort of this illusion um, that if I do what the teacher says, then my life will be free of suffering. Um, you know, if I do all the meditations the journaling, all that stuff that I won't feel experience pain. And, and what I've realized, especially recently, and it's a, a lesson that's repeated for me is that, um, the goal is not for me is not to be absent of suffering, but to sort of lean in and, and try to learn what, what is it trying to teach me? Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and so instead of resistance, it's the exact opposite of what my knee jerk reaction is, is, which is to embrace it. You know? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there are a few different things from what you said there. One of them is, you know, I make a distinction and I'm not alone in making this. It's not like I came up with this, but between suffering and pain, right? And pain Mm -hmm. is inevitable life. You're going to get a headache. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. The people you love are going to get sick. They're going to die. You're not going to get things you want. You're, or yeah, you're not going to get the things you want. You're going to get things you don't want. It's inevitable. Suffering is, can be thought of as what we layer on top of it. Mm. Right. So just like, you know, I, I use this as an example. Sometimes I have back pain right? So I have back pain. So, okay, that's the pain. But when I get the back pain and I start saying like, oh, why me? Why do I have to have back pain? Or I start to say, God, I'm too young for back pain. What am I going to be like when I'm 70? 
you know, or I start thinking I'm never going to be able to do all the things that I want to do. All that stuff is a mental thing that I've layered on top of the back pain. Right. And, and that's the suffering. And there's a, there's a, there's a phrase out there I've used on the show a lot, which is that, you know, suffering equals pain times resistance. Like you just said, you know, so, so the more, so I've got this painful situation to the extent that I resist it, do I make it worse? And a lot of times I think with pain, and this does not sound like it would go in the healer's hall of fame, right? But sometimes with pain, my goal is just not to make it any worse. And as recovering people, we know what it's like to take pain and make it worse. We oh, took it yeah. kind of to a pretty far extent, right? <laughs> we, we took it kind of, you know, like, all right, I don't like this feeling, so I'm going to change it and thus make it worse, right? And so a lot of times, you know, I'm like, if I can just get by with the pain that life hands me without adding a bunch of suffering to it, I think I'm doing pretty good. And I think that's what a lot of the spiritual teachings point to. I think that's what Buddhism points to a lot of these things. It's not that we get to a point where we don't feel anything. In a lot of cases, it's not the freedom from feeling things. It's the freedom to feel things. Mm. We, had a, we had a guest on a long time ago, a guy named David K. Reynolds. Dan Millman actually considers him a, an influence on him. And David K. Reynolds wrote a book called Constructive Living. And it would resonate with, you know, a lot of people in AA when, because in AA, you know, our 12-step programs, we focus a lot on action. But he said something that really floored me. And he said, when we're in control of our behavior, we can allow ourselves to feel our emotions fully. And I went, whoa, because when I was not in control of my behavior, emotions were scary things. Oh, yeah. What's going to happen when I get a negative emotion? Am I going to go drink? Am I going to get angry? Am I not going to go to work? Am I what like what what suffering am I going to add to the pain? But when I know that I'm in control of my behavior, I have the freedom to allow emotions to do what they need to do, which is come, be there, be felt, teach me something and move on. Oh, and that was so really good. profound to me. And so when I, when I do that, when I stop looking for life to be perfect and I just start, you know, sort of not resisting, you know, not mm-hmm. resisting. I, we did a, I did a spiritual habits workshop um, several months ago. And we'll probably do it again. But one of the principles was, you know, allow everything to be exactly the way it is. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, how do I stop resisting? You know, and we, we talk about this in recovery, you know, what is it? Page 449, right? Acceptance, I guess it is. You used know? to be 449. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little out of, I'm a little out of date with that, but, um, I know it messes me up too. Cause I was totally ingrained. <laughs> yeah. But, and, and I don't believe, you know, I don't believe acceptance is the answer to all our problems. I actually think the serenity prayer kind of nails it, right? right? You know, there's, we change, but I do think that this, this constant motion of, I don't like what's here. I want it to be something different. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's the part of the human condition that the more we can work with skillfully, the better off we are. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. That's amazing. I want to come back to this idea of, um, you know, controlling our behavior because um, that is really something that people struggle with early on in recovery. And it's typically all about the drugs or alcohol. It's like, how do I stop doing that? Yeah. And um, I think you and I understand that it's not about It's not about the problem. The solution has nothing to do with the problem. It's all about, um, really at the end of the day, it's about self-love and there's many ways to, you know, strategies to learn how to love ourselves again and accept ourselves exactly as we are accepting our human experience. But, um, I'm so curious, you know, um, typically we start with the, um, addiction story and we kind of jumped ahead to solution. Um, but I would love to hear, you know, how addiction has affected your life and how you were able to, you know, start changing those behaviors. It's, it's very, um, I think a lot of my audience is in that spot of, I want to change my behaviors. I do want to control my behaviors and how do I break the addiction? Um, and I always feel like it's helpful to hear like where people came from. I'm so curious about, you know, mm-hmm. like what was your, fa- what was your family like? Like what's your dad, what did your dad do for a living? Like, did you have siblings and all that stuff? Do you mind sharing a little bit about that? 
Sure. I'm happy to share that. Um, what did my dad do for a living? He was in management, supply chain management of different sorts. So um, nothing that seemed glamorous then nor now, particularly. <laughs> although, although that's not to say I've done those kind of jobs and they're, sure. you know, so, um, I've got a younger brother and a younger sister. My parents divorced when I was about 13. And um, Ooh, rough age. You know, I was a troubled kid from by the time I was about nine, I was kind of consistently in trouble. I was a kleptomaniac by the time I was 10, you know, vandalism, breaking and entering. I just was always kind of in trouble. Um, and so, you know, and I think I had, you know, I had a, I had a, I had two parents who were very unhappy together. I had a mom who had and still has you know, um, I would say probably major depressive disorder. I had a father who I think has it also, um, his turned, you know, his was less depressed, looked at the time less like depression and looked more like anger, but I've since learned that's a common thing in men, you know, mm -hmm. it comes out as irritability. Um, so it wasn't a real, you know, it wasn't a real happy place to be. And, um, and I don't think I was very happy in it. And so, you know, I spent, I spent my, my early years being kind of in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, that's the, that's, that's the summary of them in a, in a nutshell. What happened after your parents divorced when you were 13? Who did you live with? I lived with my mom. You did? Yeah. Where did you grow up? Uh, Columbus, Ohio. Ohio. Oh, okay, that's where you did your TED Talk in Ohio, right? It is where I still live. I still live in Columbus. I mean, I lived in California for a while, lived in New York for a while, but most of my life's been in Columbus and I actually really like it there. Although I now split my time between Columbus, Ohio and Atlanta, Georgia. So um, I sort of have two homes now, which is not ideal, but. Oh, which is not ideal. Why do you do it? My uh, girlfriend or my partner, her mother has Alzheimer's and oh. her mother lives in Atlanta. So we do live in care two weeks a month down here. Oh, and then we go to Columbus where my mom is and she's not real well. And so we go there and help take care of her. So we're kind of back and forth. It's just that season of life for us right now. I was just going to say you and I are kind of at that age where our parents get older and then we're responsible. <laughs> yes. Thank God we're sober. We can do those things. Um, yeah. So when did you, when did addiction become an issue for you? Did, when, did you start using early? Not really. I used a few times in high school and I used strangely, but not often. Um, and it wasn't really a problem. And then my last two years of high school, I, I started a tutoring program for disadvantaged children. Uh, a nonprofit, but started a nonprofit organization that was a tutoring program for disadvantaged children. And I got my first glimpse actually of what caring for, you know, doing for others, service work, you know, not being so focused on myself did. And I, those were really good years. All my other years were really challenging years. Those two years were pretty good years. Um, and when I started doing that, I saw what drugs and alcohol were doing to the kids in those uh, families. And so I just sort of said, no more. I'm not going to do it at all. And, um, but when I was 18, my, uh, my girlfriend, uh, broke up with me and started dating my best friend. And I oh. sort of, yeah, I know, I know I sort of fell apart and someone, was that your first heartbreak? Had, no, it wasn't my first, but it certainly was the, the worst, the worst, yeah, <laughs> not the worst ever, but the worst at that age. Mm -hmm. Um, and somebody one day said, here, have a, why don't you just have a drink? And I said, why, why, why not? I don't care. And it was like, that was when, you know, the proverbial switch flipped in me. And I was sure. like, this is magic. And, um, and I was just off to the races. You know, I was off to the races for the next, you know, the next six years. I got sober at, at um, partway through being 24. And, um and by that point, I was a, you know, I was a homeless heroin addict who was, you know, oh in a lot of, you know, you know, I had a lot of trouble with the law. I weighed a hundred pounds. I had hepatitis C. I mean, I was in, I was in pretty bad shape. So that six years was a pretty fast acceleration. You know, I, I feel like I took a drink one night and then drew a sober breath again, like six, you know, six years later or something. It was a, it was a pretty fast and hard, hard ride. Yeah. Not that there weren't wonderful parts of it, because of course it starts off that way, but, but by the end there was much wonder left in it. Yeah, no, that's, um, how did you end up on heroin? 
I was a musician and um, I just joined a band and I, I went, you know, I would go to band practice and I was always really messed up, you know, drinking and marijuana. And, and I just was looking at these people like, these guys are in worse shape than me. Like, what, what are they doing? And sure enough, they were doing heroin and I tried it one night and I loved it. And that yeah. was kind of, kind of defined the next few years of my life. Wow. Um, that's interesting that you saw these guys and you were like, wow, they're jacked up. How, how can I be that way? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like, exactly. Like, yeah. Like, what do they know? I don't, you know, Yeah. That's what is thing. making, what is so amazing? It's ruining their life. Um, right. yeah, no, that's uh wow. That's crazy. So how did you, how did you stop using heroin and get sober? Um, what happened? Yeah, I, I got arrested. That, that helped. That contributed. <laughs> Um, I got arrested. And when I got arrested, um, you know, when I said I was homeless, I guess I should be more specific. I was living in the back of a van um, that happened to be the van of the person I worked for. And so when I got arrested, the van went away, the job went away, the source of money went away, the source that I was stealing money from went away. And I, you know, I had a really bad heroin habit and I was like, I'm going to be really sick. And at that time, that was what I was most afraid of. And so I went into detox and I had done that before. This was not the first time I tried to get sober. And when I was there, they said, you need to go to, you know, we think we sh you should go to our 28 day program. And I, I initially just said, no, I don't, you know, no, I'm, I don't need to do that. I'm not going to do that. You know, I look back and I'm like, what exactly was I why was I, why, where did I, I think I needed to go? <laughs> oh, no, no, time, not that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, but I went back to my room and I had, you know, we describe them sometimes as moments of clarity. And I think I had a moment of clarity that was like, I'm going to die if I go back out there. Yeah. You know, like I just knew I was either going to die or I was going to go to jail for a long time. It just was really evident that I was at the end. Um, and so I went to that 28 day treatment program that then eventually, you know, I got out of that and then chose to go, you know, after a while I went into a halfway house and I just threw myself into 12 step recovery and, you know, lo and behold, got sober. That's amazing. Yeah. It's so funny because there are so many of us that have that extreme personality. We're kind of all or nothing. Like our energy is so intense, but what's interesting is when it's channeled, it's like that beam is so strong and we can accomplish amazing things when we channel that energy. Yes. Yep. And I, I, that's a great way to describe it. And I think that's what happened is I just took yeah. all, all that energy and I laser focused it on getting sober. And, you know, and I was, I have this conversation with people sometimes about, you know, what, what got you sober? And it's such a mysterious question. You know, it's mm -hmm. such a, because you know, on one hand I could go, well, I got arrested and then I went to detox and then I, but people get arrested all the time. People go to treatment all the time. They don't get sober. No. And it's God's own mystery really to me. It is the biggest mystery in life to me why some of us get it and some of us don't. And if one of us could actually really answer that question, we'd be rich beyond all repair because if we could actually say, here's exactly how people get sober. Here's how to make everybody get sober. You'd, you know you'd solve a, you'd solve a humanity's, one of humanity's lifelong struggles. So th there isn't an answer, but I started thinking about it and, and I, I sort of realized like, yeah, a bottom had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing that had a lot to do with it is that for whatever reason, that bottom coincided with hope. Mm -hmm. I think both those things really had to be there. Yeah. The bottom alone is not enough. Right. And, and, um, but for whatever reason, my bottom happened. And then shortly thereafter, whatever it was, I began to see like, oh, there's another life. There's a way out. And I began to believe that maybe it could happen for me. And I think when those two things came together, that was at least for me, the fertile ground that sort of birthed recovery. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, the bottom plus hope. And But to go back to what you were saying about, you know, if we could answer that question, well, I feel like um, everybody is so different and people get sober. There's so many ways that people get sober. I feel like it's almost like the question of like, who is God? <laughs> there yeah. is no answer to that. But the seeking of that question, the seeking of that answer to that question forces us to go sort of on this journey. And, it, and it's always a journey back to self and 
self-examination, exploration, and how I, how do I, like, what is controlling the world? How do I control my own behavior? Like you were talking about. And, but it's in that seeking and struggling that we transform, right? So if we handed everybody this answer on a silver platter, do you see, yeah, you see where I'm going with this? I I totally get it. I totally. Yeah, yeah, that that would not work. It's just it's such a it's such a mystery and such a painful mystery why some people get it and some don't. It's just heartbreaking. And if it you're is. around long enough, you you see real heartbreak, you know. You see you and I talked about before how, you know, and we'll probably get to this, I stayed sober for a period of time and then, you know, I went back out and I've been back about 13 years and But a lot of people who kind of came back in with me that second time who had had an amount of time, like I can think of three of them are dead and two others who they just can't get it. They had they had years of sobriety in AA, Mm -hmm. five years, 10 years, 15 years, and they went back out and they cannot get it again. Yeah. And it's just it's just heartbreaking. I don't know. You know, and I, and I look at myself and I'm like, well, I don't fully know how I got through that. I don't know how I did it. I mean, I can tell you the steps I took. Mm hmm. But that doesn't seem to be the whole story. It doesn't. It it really is one of those great mysteries. You know, uh, why is it so much harder the second time? I, I've seen that myself, and I have a very similar experience to um, as a witness. You know, I've been in the rooms a long time, just like you, and and uh, people people don't always make it back. I mean, I've I've interviewed people who. Um, have since passed away and um, not always from this disease, but yeah, if you, I remember when I first got sober and I went to, I did the same thing you did with the uh, 12 step groups. I didn't get to go to rehab. I'm a little jealous. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing, <laughs> but um, yeah, just that, I mean, it's just an amazing experience why some people get it and, and some people don't, but um, yeah, I like that idea of the the bottom plus hope. I, I, when I was introduced to the, the 12 steps, that was, that was what they, you know what they said? They said, welcome home. And I was like, I could take a deep breath and like relax for the first time and and realize I could, I could just, that y'all got my kind of crazy and that I could find a new normal and everything was going to be okay. There was that, that hope. Yep. So, um, what do you think, why do you think you made the decision to start? Did you start drinking or what? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit of a, it's a slightly convoluted story, but I'll try and make my way through it somewhat. <laughs> okay. So um, several years after, so when I got, when I got sober, I had a girlfriend, uh, we were heroin users together and um, we had an on again, off again relationship. We separated early on in sobriety um, we were told that was a good thing to do, and it turned out to thus be the case. But then we got back together, and we had a child together. Okay. And um, and then she, um, she chose to leave um, when my son was two, and you know, for a guy who was an AA um, that we knew, and and I again had sort of a major heartbreak, and I did not drink then, but what happened was. I think when I got sober, I was, I was sort of, we hear you have to have a spiritual life, you know, God, as we understand him, a higher power. And I just took the one that was offered, which was, you know, a, you know, a God, this, this, this thing out there, God, that sort of intervenes in our lives and does things for us. Right. And I had a very, but I didn't fully believe it, but I made myself believe it. But when my life really fell apart, I realized I did not have a spiritual life that was re- that I really deeply believed in and really propped me up. Mm-hmm. My spiritual life as I had it at that point did not know how to accommodate something like, oh, you can be an AA sponsoring lots and lots of people, really active, have all these service positions, and then your wife can leave you for someone else in AA when you've got a two-year-old and the rest of the world will just go on like nothing happened. Like my spiritual life just couldn't accommodate. It oh just, it kind of broke it. It mm-hmm. kind of broke my, and so I didn't drink right away. I didn't drink for, for several years. But what I did do is I started drifting away from AA. Um, but even more than that, I think what I did was I started really drifting back into very self-centered behavior. Mm-hmm. I became very focused on me. What about me? What about me? What about me? You know, um, 
And so that just slowly led to, you know, the thought started coming back, like, well, maybe you could drink. And I went, you know, and it was very logical. It was like, well, you were doing heroin then. Like, that's a terrible idea. We all know that's a bad idea. Like, we're not going to do that again. Mm -hmm. And you've gone through so much therapy and you've been to so many meetings. And look at your life now. You show up for work every day. You're more successful than you've ever been. You make good decisions about eating. You make good decisions about exercise. You make good decisions about how to raise your son. You, you were just young then and you were doing heroin. And of course, you had a problem. But now you're, you'd be okay. And then I found out that my brother who got sober off heroin about a year after me had been drinking for about six months. Oh, and he didn't tell and, you? Nope. And he said, I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. And that was sort of the final straw in my, cause I was like, Oh, look, I, you know, I thought it was this genetic thing, but my brother's doing it. He's fine. That was, and so I just said, you know what? Oh. Drink again. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the amazing part was that for a little while, nothing bad happened. You know, I, I think it, in AA, at least when I was around in those days, we used to tell these stories. Like if I take a drink, I'll be shooting heroin on the East side in eight hours. You know, like <laughs> yeah. we're so dramatic, so dramatic, <laughs> you know, if I take a drink, I'll be dead before the sun comes up, you know, <laughs> and I took a drink and I was like, I had hmm. one beer and everything was fine. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. And nothing happened for a while. But slowly but surely, the wheels started to turn. And I never went back to heroin. But I was, you know, I drank and I did, I did, uh, you know, I smoked an, an enormous amount of marijuana. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say a little weed. An enormous yeah, amount. <laughs> an enormous amount. Yes. Okay. Um, and, you know, I eventually hit a point where what I was able to realize from having been sober before was that I was just as sick then as I was in the beginning. Yeah. I had a nice house in the suburbs. I had the best job I ever had. You know, I was driving a BMW. I mean, all the things that would make you go, look, things are fine here, right? Certainly not homeless in a van. Right. But inside, I knew that I was every bit as out of control as I had been when I was 24. Yeah. The substance was just different, right? And alcohol is a substance that you can carry, you know, I think it's possible to carry on drinking for a lot longer than it is to carry on shooting heroin for, <laughs> for, some, yeah. for some reasons that have everything to do with laws and nothing else, right? You know, alcohol is yes. legal, heroin's not. Thus, heroin's very expensive. Thus, you have to do dangerous things to get it. I mean, all that stuff. And so, you know, alcohol just, I could have, I could have, kept doing it. Um, and I had, I had for me, what was a bottom, but in comparison to the previous bottoms, it was a, it was a flea bite, you know, yeah, yeah. but it was enough. Yeah. And I could see like, I'm just as sick. I'm just as sick. You know, um, I'm not doing the things I had to do then to get drugs, but I would. Yeah. Right. You know, if alcohol suddenly became illegal tomorrow, you know, things would look very different. Yeah. Um, so it, that was enough for me to sort of come back. Although, like I said, it was really difficult coming back. You know, it was, that was a slog for sure. The first time felt like, well, it felt like grace, you know, even though I don't necessarily believe in that concept exactly, it did feel like it felt pretty easy. Easy is the wrong word, but in comparison to what the second time was, it felt easy, you know, and the first time I got to go into treatment and I got to go into a halfway house and it was all new. Every idea was brand new, you know, yeah. and there was so much hope. And the second time I was like, I know all this stuff for God's sake, you know, like, um, I did an interesting thing before I got sober. The second time I went to a program called moderation management <laughs> and it's a real program. It's a real program. Yeah. And it, it, um, it's, it believes this and, and I don't, I don't disagree with the fundamental tenet of it. The tenet of it is not everybody who's got a quote unquote problem with drinking is an alcoholic. I agree. So not everybody needs to go turn their life over in a 12 step program and go to a meeting every day, the rest of their life. Right. For some of these people, they can choose to moderate. And we all know people like this, people that we, you know, if you look at any college campus on any given night, on any given weeknight, you're like... It, 80% of this campus qualifies as alcoholic under the definition, right? They're blackout drinking, you know, <laughs> yeah. but 99, you know, but a vast majority of them will go on to drink 
socially at years later, right? So I believe the premise. Um, so I was like, I'm going to go to moderation management. And I'm going to learn to moderate because I knew what was coming if I didn't. I knew what was coming with sobriety and abstinence. And I didn't, you know, from the alcoholic mindset, that's the worst fate imaginable, abstinence, right? Abstinence, yeah. Nobody wants that. No, right. Why would you? And so I went to moderation management and I worked the hell out of that program. Um, I mean, I took it so seriously and I couldn't do it. Mm, yeah. um, sometimes I could do it for like a night, but what I realized, and I, I kind of understood that line in the big book that says, you know, we, we can't Can control, control or enjoy our drinking. <laughs> and I was like, I can sort of maybe control it, but when I do, it's misery. Mm-hmm. Or I can just let, let go of the reins and sort of enjoy it. But there's no way I could do both. And the truth is I couldn't do either at that point, really. I wasn't, it wasn't enjoyable and I couldn't control it. But boy, the effort to try and control it was misery. I remember a lot of nights sitting at my, my downstairs sink. And it's like 11 at night. I got to get up at six in the morning and go to work. And I'm sitting there with a bottle of whiskey. And I'm like, just go to bed. There is no, re- I'm going to go upstairs in five minutes and lay down in bed. There is no reason on God's green earth to take another shot. None. And yet I would lose that battle more often than I won. Mm-hmm. Like I just couldn't, I was just, and it, and, and it was misery. So, but the reason I bring that up is because it was really good for me when I got sober because I went, I tried. Yes. I tried to moderate my drinking really hard. And it's a learning that I use often. I go back to it and I go, see, look, that did not work. Um, so it was a useful exercise for me to, to do that. And I think, you know, the, the, the big book sort of says that, like, if you're not convinced, go out and try and have a few drinks, see go what try. happens. Go try you moderation. Know? Yeah. Um, and, and so it was a, it was a good experience for me. Yeah. Um, I just interviewed, um, Dr. Adi Jaffe and he wrote a book called the abstinence myth. Yeah, he, you know, um, I did not agree. Listen, I understand that there, like you were saying that there are some people who can moderate. That's all, that's all well and good. But for those of us who, um, you know, I'll just say alcoholic just for simpler terms, instead of trying to define the alcohol use disorder and go down that rabbit hole. Um, there are those of us who require abstinence for, a healthy lifestyle. And I think that is such an important question to answer is, can I moderate? And I think that, that, uh, you know, I, I had people and listen, I put a trigger warning on that episode that I, that I published that this is going to be a trigger warning because of what you were talking about. It's like people with long-term sobriety, that question comes up occasionally. It's, was I, was I really, was I really, maybe I was just sick, I, you know, the heroin thing. Maybe I was, yeah. you know, I was 25 when I got something. Maybe I was just young, mm-hmm. you know, look at me now. <laughs> you know, it's like, right, right, right. And uh, I think that is such an important question to answer, you know, once and for all is, you know, uh, can I moderate? And for me, the answer is no. Yeah, no, it's for me too. And the interesting thing about moderation management as a program for me is although the thing was like, you know, this is for people who don't have that serious of a problem. What I found was moderation management was littered with alcoholics who just didn't want to face having to be sober. They were still answering that question, that, which is, I that, think, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's who was in there. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, it, it's very interesting because, you know, once upon a time, I would have said abstinence is the answer for everybody who's an alcoholic and that's it. Yeah, right? me too. And I don't believe that anymore. Although I do believe for most people who have a, a real addiction, abstinence is the way of life that is going to be easiest for them. But, but the idea of harm reduction has really gained a yeah. lot of momentum in the mm-hmm. world. And it's, it's a useful idea, right? And, yeah. and it's interesting because if you look at it and you go, well, let's take somebody who, let's just say, is a heroin addict and they use once a month now instead of every day. Casual we- heroin use? Is that a thing? Well, some people are able to, some people, I, I am always careful with this because I, with you, I think there's a trigger warning here. And I think that is, it, we will, like I said before, when I was sitting in active alcoholism, the thought of abstinence was the worst thing in the world. Because so you lose your best friend. 
Yeah. Right. You lose your best friend, even though your best friend isn't your best friend. But at the time you think your best friend is your best friend. But, but, but this idea of, of harm reduction and Gabor Mate talks a lot about this, you know, a real expert in addiction and, and, um, you know, he talks about, you know, some people who are so damaged, you know, is, is, is a reduction in use, you know, the best those people can hope for. In AA, they say, you know, people who are incapable of being constitutionally honest, uh, honest with themselves, right? Is there a class of people? And I think all this gets, gets into a, a lot of gray area. Although I think for most people who would probably be listening to this show and the vast majority of us, abstinence is the route that is, you know, leads to the best quality of life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And those, for those people, um, where harm reduction, um, is useful, it still seems like it sets them on the path that's different than the one that they were previously on, which is destruction, right? So we go from harm reduction as, um, from a, uh, a conclusion that's pretty predetermined to, um, you know, harm reduction is like, that's where the possibilities, um, right. really lie. So there's, there's multiple, um, results on that path. Right. And that's where we expose ourselves to new teachers and new ideas. And I think that's where we evolve to a better place. Whereas, um, you know, there, you know, really severe addictions, alcoholism and stuff like that for, you know, just lead to an inevitable, you know, place of death and suffering and all, yep. all bad, all bad things. Yep. So, um, being yeah. alive increases your chances of getting fully sober. <laughs> yes, it does. And, and, you know, it's interesting because in all these things, it's like, we talk about gray areas, but if, and that's when we're speaking about people in general and generalities. And because we, we're talking about people who are very different, right? But if we do a case study on the individual, like what's right or wrong for them becomes pretty clear when it's focused on just one person set of circumstances. But that's why we need help from other people because when we're in it, we can't see it. You know, it's like that self denial is so strong, we can't really see the clear cut answers, you know, we have all this emotion and it's, and it's just my opinion that emotion obscures our perspective. And, you know, it's so easy to see someone from the outside. It's so easy for them to see what you need to do. It's because they're not clouded by emotion. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very well said. There's something called Solomon's paradox and, and, you know, it talks about King Solomon who, if we know King Solomon, right, we know he was known for being wise. You know, we still hear the wisdom of King Solomon thousands Mm -hmm. of years later, right? Well, and people traveled from all around the world to get King Solomon's wisdom. Well, apparently in his own life, the guy was kind of a basket case, right? (laughs) He was so wise, but he couldn't do it for himself. And I think we are all that way. We are all that way to, to some degree. For sure. Yeah, we really do need each other. It's like every every everyone that I admire has somebody that they can lean on for support and clarity and to help them sort things out when they yep. get emotional and can't and and they lose all perspective. So um yeah. and I and I think what you said there about gray areas, right? I'm a one of my favorite teachings of all time is the Buddha's teaching of the middle way. And I believe in almost everything in life, the middle way, avoiding extremes saves us from trouble except in my case abstinence is not a middle way but that is that I mean, that that's an exception to that rule right yeah. there's you know there's something you know there's something different about me i don't know what it is i don't know why it is but um so i'm a big believer in the middle way i'm a big believer in gray areas but i also i often say to people you know i love the clarity of none you know, yes. there is a great deal of clarity to none. Yeah. You know, when you get into should I, shouldn't I, how much, and you can do that with any, and you know, anything. There, there's there's a great deal of clarity, and a lot of energy gets freed up. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the big things I teach people in my coaching program is we set, you know, is to separate decision from action, right? Oh, Decide, tell me about that. Well. Yeah. So a lot of us, if we don't decide in advance what we're doing, then we are in the moment trying to decide what to do and then actually doing it. And that's really hard to do because 
in the moment, um, we're not very clear. Like you said, we're very obscured by emotion. Mm-hmm. You know, so the way I think of it is I think of a of, of sort of a higher and a lower self. And don't we don't need to take this in any spiritual way or anything. But the higher self, I would say, is the self that can sit back and really think about what's important to me. What matters to me? What do I want to do with my life? What's the direction I want to go? What's good for me? What's bad for me? Right? That that higher self can do that. The problem is, then there's the lower self. And the lower self is the one that shows up day to day with us. It's the one that gets hungry. It's the one that gets angry. It's the one that gets tired. It's the one that sees a, cook, a cupcake. It's right. And, and, the, and so there's a lot of benefit in stepping back and going, all right, what's important to me? What do I want to do? Who do I want to be? And deciding that. And then when the time comes, all you got to do is take the action. If, if you try and do both at the same time, we tend to get confused. So for example, you know, one of the things I talk a lot about, like, and this is very simple, anybody can, can learn from this. Like if you want to build, let's just say an exercise program, right? You are far more likely to do it if you say, all right, I'm going to exercise Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m. And I'm going to do running and I'm going to do it at uh, Alum Creek right? Your likelihood of doing that goes way up over, you know, I'm going to run some more this week. Right. Being specific. Yeah. You know, most of us have vague intentions, but the specificity makes a huge difference. And that's sort of separating the decision from action, right? Oh, I love that. Um, Separate decision from action. Yeah. It, it, it makes a huge difference in what you're trying to change. And AA actually kind of does a good job of this because it's like, you know, you're going to go Monday night to this meeting at this time at this place. Mm-hmm. Like it's clear, yeah. you know, it's clear your way, you know, and, and that's why, you know, a home group, you know, each week on a Tuesday night, here's where you're going to be. You've separated your decision from action instead of going, well, I'm going to, should I go to a meeting today? Once we get into that debate, you know, and so that's the, that's the clarity of none. You know, it's separating decision from action. I've decided I'm not doing that. Mm. You know? and, and we all know what this, is. you know, we can apply it to something like alcoholism, but we can apply it to things that are far more subtle, like eating. Like, I want to eat better. We, how many of us say that all of the time? I want to eat better. What does that mean? Yeah. When I'm out to dinner with my friends next week, does that mean I get dessert or I don't get dessert? Right. If you don't know the answer, nine times out of 10, the dessert's coming. <laughs> right? Amen. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's, that's just the way it works. So separating decision from action is really helpful. And, and, you know, and, you know, knowing that like, I don't drink is, is a real clear, you know, it's pretty clear at that point. Yeah. Super clear. I love that. And I um, have to comment on the, the eating. I, I heard your interview with the lady who talked about emotional eating. Was it Julie, yeah. Julie Simon? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought that was such a good one. I mean, that's one of the things that I think almost everybody struggles with, especially after 40. <laughs> you know, yeah. One of those things. And, uh, but it was interesting, you know, and all these things that we're talking about, and to me, in my mind, it always comes back to what are the strategies that we can use for like, self-care. It's like, what, what is at the bottom of this? And of all the interviews that you've done, are you recognizing reoccurring themes? Yeah, there's certainly a lot of reoccurring themes. Um, they're not, they're, they're not very, uh, exciting. Um, (laughs) I, I can't tell you the number of times that exercise, eating right, (laughs) Sleeping well, yeah. In time, you know, connecting with people you love comes up. You know, yeah. meditating. You know, those things are are there, right? And it's one of the genius things. You know, I, over the years, I have drifted away from twelve step a little bit, and I have some I have some challenges with twelve step. I also, it saved my life, right? Yeah. And I, it's a wonderful thing in a lot of ways. And one of the things that I think is brilliant about twelve steps is it, it builds in some of those, those very principles, you know, they're right there, you know, the connection with others. And so, but yeah, I mean, it, to me, I consider things like eating right, 
and exercising and getting enough sleep and meditating. For me, those are like the, the foundations. Absolutely. Do you journal too? I don't, I don't, but I do do a lot of reflection. You know, I end up, you know, um, I do the podcast. I create programs for people. I do a mini episode each week that I give to supporters of the show where I do like some sort of teaching. And so, um, I'm reflecting a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It so sounds like you process out loud. I do. Yes. That's a great way to say it. I do a lot of out loud processing. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, you know, probably the fundamental one of those is exercise. Mm. But I've I've dealt with depression. I think I dealt with it when I was young. I deal with it now. And it's, that seems to be the single biggest sort of like depression helper for me. Absolutely. I wish it was an easier one. I mean, I really, you know, I just think it's so boring to be like, it's like eat your vegetables. You know, it's just, it's not very fun. Like we, it'd be, it'd be much better if I could tell you about, you know, carrying a, a crystal in a certain kind of pocket. <laughs> like we'd all like that more. Well, nobody wants to acknowledge that we already have the answer. We already have the answer yep. and nobody wants to do it, but we you know, they say that pain is the touchstone of all growth. And for me, it's like, I already had the answer. I had the answers when I was six years old, but I had to go through this whole process of <laughs> <laughs> suffering and addiction to be willing to get beat down enough to submit and surrender to what the answers are. And for me, it's, it's kind of interesting to feel like I'm in this, um, I'm on this path that's, you know, the path is beset with danger and death and really extreme things that if I don't stay on the beam and take, do the things I know that I have to do to take care of myself and evolve, you know, feed the good wolf, right. Um, that if I don't, the consequences, the consequences for me are so severe that, um, I have to, I have to. And so it's been sort of like the best worst thing that ever happened to me, this whole, you know, I just blanket blanket everything under addiction, but right. it's the best worst thing that ever happened to me. It's, you know, Ryan holiday wrote this book called the obstacle is the way. Yes. And that sums up, that sums up my recovery journey, so to speak, is that, um, the thing that was the obstacle, it turned out to be the thing that saves me on the regular, because even now I've been sober a long time, but even now I'll skip my morning routine. I yeah. pay for that shit all day long when I don't do it. Yeah, no, it's it's true. It really does, you know, how we how we take care of ourselves really matters, you know. And and you know, we started this conversation sort of saying like, you know, life isn't without pain. Life isn't without challenge, but I think we can we can do our best to keep that more minimal, right? Yeah. You know, and and I think that's that's an ongoing process for me of what does that look like and how does that work and um you know, how do we suffer as little as possible and how, and how do we take the, the pain that we have in life? And like you said, make it something positive, you know, yeah, make it I'm useful. a really, yeah, I'm a really big believer. I don't believe that everything happens for a reason. That's not my personal belief system. A lot of people have it. What I do believe though, or I don't believe that everything happens for the best, but I do believe we can make the best out of everything that happens. I and I do believe more. that in every situation, there is a kernel of transformation in it. Mm -hmm. And there are times there's nothing more annoying than being in a huge amount of pain and have somebody say, well, it's growth opportunity. It's like, you know, stab yeah, you. <laughs> you put a fork in your forehead. Um, <laughs> although it is often helpful to remember that, like yeah. it is, you know, it is often helpful for me when I'm really suffering to go, oh, okay, this could lead to something better, but it's almost always true. Yeah. You absolutely. know, and, and pain is a weird thing because you can't, my experience is I can't shortcut it. Right. I cannot add to it. And that's what we talked about in the beginning. I cannot make it worse, but I can't shortcut it. But I can also let it teach me and inform me. Somebody asked me the other day on a podcast, like, well, how much is your recovery from addiction sort of influenced who you are today? And I was like, I, that question doesn't register. Like I can't, I, I could not begin to separate out who I would be. I know, right? Had I not gone through the addiction and the, the subsequent 
countless number of years in recovery. It's an, it's a question that just doesn't compute. I can't, I can't say, Oh, it's about 60% of who, I mean, it just, it's just baked into everything yeah. that I, that I do. And so, you know, it is, and I think that's the thing that, that can be helpful when you're sitting at the very beginning, we talked about, you know, recovery can happen when, um, you know, a, a bottom and hope. And then I think the other piece of that is support, right? The right support oh, and those sure. three things show up. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times we sit at the beginning of this and we think I've just got to get sober. It's miserable. It's awful. It's all that. Right. And, mm-hmm. and the, the thing that going to, to 12 step groups or any sort of support group did for me is it made me go like, those people seem like they're doing pretty darn well. Mm-hmm. Like this just isn't the relieving of a symptom. This is a transformation of who I am in a really deep, profound, and beautiful way. Yeah, I love that. Um, And I want to sort of transition a little, talk about transformation. Uh, I want to just shift gears a little bit into um, talking about your coaching program because I think it's so interesting. You know, sometimes these teachers that change our lives so deeply, they're sort of this um, self-imposed separation where we think, oh, but they're not accessible, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is, is that um, you're somebody who is accessible and, you know, why not work with somebody who not only has what you want, but they have what they want, right? I think that's kind of, you know. <laughs> wow, that's a great way of, of spinning that phrase that I've never heard before. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't, that wasn't my idea that I, um, I will totally pass that along to you. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I know that you're accessible. So how do people uh, work with you? Because you do one-on-one coaching, that's right. I do. I do do one-on-one coaching. I mean, the, I mean, if you want to know how to find out about it, you can go to ericzimmer.coach um, and, and learn more. But as far as what I do, you know, I work with people on how to make a change. You know, typically people who've tried to make a change before and haven't been successful. So I work with people. And then I also generally work with people who sort of feel stuck and are going like, what's next? Like a lot of us, we hit this point in sobriety. We get, we get a certain number of years. We've sort of worked the steps. And then it just all of a sudden feels like, well, now what? Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you know Bill Wilson called AA spiritual kindergarten, right? Like what, what's, what's next, you know? Right. Um, so, so a lot of what I do is, you know, so a lot of some of the stuff I do like People are like, I want to build an exercise routine, or I hear that exercise and eating right and meditation are good for self care. But you know what? I can't. I cannot be consistent at it. Mm-hmm. Right? I get a lot of people coming to me who say, I'm the kind of person who can't stick with anything. I don't have any discipline. I can't finish in anything. I st-, you know, and and I don't believe we are those kind of people. I believe that behavior change is a skill. I believe it's something you can learn. We learned how to get sober. Right. Right. We went and people who knew what they were doing showed us the path and behavior change, I think, is very, very similar. So I don't buy like, oh, you're just undisciplined. You're just lazy. You're just I think we just don't know how. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of science out there about how to do it. So I work with people who are trying to make changes like that. Like I want to get consistent about exercise and eating. Um, I work with, you know, authors who are trying to finish a book or start a book. I work with people who are launching businesses like, okay, I'm trying to launch this thing on the side, but I can't seem to put any energy into it. Um, you know, so whatever kind of change somebody wants to make is kind of what I, I work with people to do. Breaking through to the next level. I love that. I might have to call you later. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, listen, uh, you've been so generous with your time. Um, I can't wait to publish this so that people can get to know you and listen to your podcast and kind of hang out with you. I always encourage people I work with to, you know, what was so helpful to me in early recovery was listening to Marianne Williamson cassette tapes because there was yeah. no such thing as a podcast. That's then. right. No, not even close. <laughs> right. But uh, I recognized even then that if I was listening to something positive that my inner critic didn't have any space. Yeah. yeah. 
So, um, and your podcast is absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm so grateful that, uh, I had an opportunity to come across it and hear more about your experiences with it. And I just have such a soft spot in my heart for people who are willing to, um, you know, share the message and, and, and I, I know it's a lot of work. So I just want to say thank you on behalf of everyone who loves you for doing all that work. Well, thank you. You're doing the exact same work. So thank you. And, and I've really enjoyed talking with you. It's been fun. Thank you so much. I hope to talk to you again soon. You have a great day. You too. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.